Good morning, everyone. Welcome to, the, to this month's edition of Morning in the Morning. I'm Brandon Fess, Special Collections Librarian with the Local History and Genealogy Division at the Rochester Public Library. Today's presentation is the Underground Railroad with our speaker, Sally Millick. Rochester and Central New York were a hotbed of social and religious change in 19th century America. In the face of laws and practices designed to enforce the status quo of American slavery, many African Americans used the Underground Railroad to move from bondage in the South to freedom in the North. How did this path to freedom work and what role did Rochesterians play? Sally Millick is a past trustee of the Friends of Mount Hope Cemetery and a longtime cemetery tour author, researcher, and guide. She's currently a board member of the Friends and Foundation of the Rochester Public Library. Millick has contributed to several books in the history of upstate New York and Mount Hope Cemetery, and has photographed many Victorian area cemeteries in her travels, uh, including Cologne Cemetery in Havana, Cuba, and most recently cemeteries in Spain. Without further ado, Sally Millick. Hi, everyone. Good morning, and thanks for joining us. Uh, as Brandon said, today's topic is uh, Underground Railroad, and when I do this as a tour at the cemetery, I call it the Underground Railroad Tracks. And the reason for that is that um, we certainly want to talk about the Underground Railroad. Also, we want to talk about what is it that led to Rochester being such a hotbed in with the Underground Railroad, and how did it really come together, and what was the effects on that leading into the Civil War and um, and the Emancipation Proclamation. So uh, as Brendan mentioned, I actually am now back on the board of the Friends of Mount Hope Cemetery. Um, this content comes primarily from the Underground Railroad Tracks Tour. So we'll be concentrating our stories around pe those people that are buried at our iconic, beautiful Victorian rural cemetery here in Rochester. Um, just also wanted to let you know that um, one thing that I've really started to be interested in is actually quoting the people in history and, and hearing things from their perspective. So I hope that things don't get too text or um, voice heavy, but I think it's more interesting to hear how they depicted what was going on rather than me uh, recounting that for you. I also would like to point out that Mount Hope Cemetery was never a segregated cemetery. It, has, it was one of uh, America's first municipally owned, meaning it's owned by the city of Rochester and continues to be. Um, and though there are plots that are dedicated to certain groups, uh, that is by their volition. So a synagogue may have a, a plot or the University of Rochester has a plot, but it was never a segregated uh, cemetery. And as I said, we've heard of a lot of prominent abolitionists and their contributions. Now a lot of these people, just the way that history is written, um, are non-people of color, um, but it's important also to understand that there was certainly a lot of participants and supporters of the Underground Railroad um, of all colors and backgrounds. So just to start at square one, what was the Underground Railroad? Um, this was a network of, of abolitionists, of people who wanted to help these um, enslaved people um, escape from slavery. Here in the middle, we have this map of the blue states, which were slave states, and the yellow states, which were free states. Um, but it wasn't enough to just make it from the slave states into the free states, because as we'll see, there was a lot of changing legislation that actually allowed people to come up from the slave states and retrieve freed slaves and bring them back. There was also um, a big push to get people into Canada, really, and Western New York. And a lot of these routes you see here allowed this passage of people to come up through the Northern states and then over to Canada to freedom. As many of you may know, uh, in the early to mid 19th century, the Rochester region was really a hotbed of all kinds of discussion and debate about social issues, causes. We had uh, women's suffrage, we had abolition. Uh, there was a lot of religious consternation and um, actually new religions formed. We had the Mormon church form in Palmyra, New York, and we had the um, spiritualist movement start uh, just outside of Newark, New York. Um, and in 1825, with the Erie Canal coming through, uh, crossing New York State, 
this brought a lot of wealth to Rochester and uh, thus Rochester was one of America's first boom towns, which had a big pop in population, big pop in wealth and business and um, obviously um, transport because of the canal uh, conduit. So legislatively, in, uh, slavery was legal in New York State in various forms until 1827. And what we saw was a gradual, um, what they called a gradual emancipation law. So in 1799, there was a law established in New York State that said um, that children that were born after July 4th, 1799, and the irony of that date isn't lost, um, they would be free, but but they had they were going to be indentured until they were young adults, and then they were going to be given their freedom. Um, in 1817, that law was updated, said, okay, the, the people who are in slavery now, who were born before 1799, will be free without indenture, but they're not going to be free until 1827. And then finally, in 1827, New York State was actually the first state to pass a law for the total abolition of legal slavery. And by that, I mean that other states had um, laws that outlawed slavery, but there was all kinds of loopholes that allowed slavery to continue in a lot of different forms. So New York State passed that in 1827. And then subsequently, um, a few decades later, there was the Fugitive Slave Act, which enabled, as I was alluding to, uh, people, slave catchers, to come up from down south and retrieve escaped slaves. Um, and the other outcome of this is that sometimes you'd have freedom seekers or, or you'd have um, slave seekers come up and just abduct a person of color just for being a person of color, it, you know, under the auspices, like, oh, I'm sure they belong to somebody or, you know, there was a big bounty hunting type of movement. Um, and the Fugitive Slave Act was enforced, which meant that all this activity to move the slaves into freedom um, had to be going underground, which is where we partially where we get the term underground railroad. So here we see a uh, picture actually of Main Street in Rochester in 1840. Uh, here we're looking east. And for those of you in Rochester, the most familiar landmarks here would be these buildings here, which currently um, is where the uh, Powers Building stands on the corner of State Street and Main Street, and then a little bit more west on Main Street, uh, the, the former Powers Hotel, which at this point was the uh, National Hotel. So this is just a picture. Uh, you see the dirt roads again, 1840, a uh, boom town, but uh, by no means uh, uh, modern by our standards. So the first uh, person I want to talk about who uh, resides at Mount Hope now is John Morrison. And John Morrison um, has no monument. So I was at the cemetery recently and was able to get this beautiful shot of the area where we believe uh, he is interred. Um, John Morrison was a person of color and again wanted to make sure that uh, we're aware there was a lot of people, supporters of the Underground Railroad, um, white, black, mulatto, Native American, that were active. And so in the 1851-1852 African-American head of household census, um, John Morrison was listed as a waiter, butler, and barber living at 32 Vine Street. And Vine Street is downtown um, here near the Little Theater. Um, but he worked in Niagara Falls and he would take the train from Rochester to Niagara Falls uh, for work at a hotel called the Cataract House. Um, we also have some other records of him. He registered for the draft in 1863 out of Monroe County. Um, and again, in 1865, he was shown as the head waiter at the Cataract House. Here is a rare drawing of John Morrison um, that someone had made, and he was held in very high esteem by his colleagues. Uh, and I think a lot of that was due to his participation in the Underground Railroad. So in his obituary in the Niagara Falls Gazette, uh, it's listed that he was many years a head waiter at the Cataract House. He died at his residence in Rochester. He was well known in Niagara Falls and will be remembered by old habituals of the Cataract House with whom he was a favorite. His death is lamented by a wide circle of friends who knew his private worth. 
So the Cataract House, to drill down a little bit on that, uh, the Cataract House was noted by Southerners as, quote, a perilously, as being perilously, perilously close to the river and noted that hotel employees regularly enticed these slaves to run to Canada. Now, here's a picture of the Cataract House, and you can see in the foreground here, I believe this is water. So this was directly on the, the river between the United States and Canada. And this is a plaque that exists there now that um, cites that the African-American staff guided freedom seekers to Canada from here. And there is a museum in Niagara Falls where you can actually look toward uh, over the river to see what that path might have looked like. Um, other Southerners claim that hotel employees abducted and forcibly removed the Southerners' rightful property to Canada. Um, but my, my favorite, if you could call it that, just for the ironic twist, um, is this article that, uh, or bulletin that was in a New Orleans newspaper uh, who had a slave enticed from him while on a visit to Niagara Falls. He wrote home from Niagara Falls as follows. The proprietors of the Cataract House keep in their employ as servants a set of free Negroes, many of whom have wives and relatives in Canada. They have an organized plan of taking off all slaves that come into the house. The Mrs. Whitney, the owners, keep these fellows in their employ, knowing them to be engaged in this business. Therefore, it behooves all Southern people who travel north to avoid the Cataract House at the Falls of Niagara. Um, Morrison not only facilitated this uh, program, as, as this man was depicting, he actually ferried some of the seekers across the river himself. And so it's kind of a beautiful irony that he ended up at Mount Hope Cemetery, resting near some of our most prominent abolitionists. And here we have a view of the Cataract House from Boat Island, the island between the US and Canada. And then here we actually have the funeral, the um, death record at Mount Hope Cemetery of John Morrison dying um, in November 1869 of uh, paralysis, living on Vine Street, and then giving his plot. And I'll just say here that if anyone uh, thinks that you have a relative or somebody that you're trying to research buried at Mount Hope, uh, one of the beauties of always being a municipally owned cemetery is that there's meticulous records kept of burials, whether or not someone has a monument, which is how I was able to find more. <clears throat> a lot of these records are now digitized and available online. So to give a background of the next set of uh, Underground Railroad conductors I'm going to talk about, uh, we really need to understand the Quakers or the Society of Friends, a religious organization. This is an organization that was founded in 17th century England, and they had a very um, equal minded view of the world. They believe that all men and women are unique and have equal worth in the eyes of God. And they also believe that you did not need to go through a priest or some type of conduit to have your own relationship with God. That was up to you and your conscience. And they lived by principles of simplicity, truth, equality, community. Um, they dressed very plainly. They had uh, at Mount Hope and other cemeteries. They had very simple gravestones. Uh, so they were simple people, but they their inclination toward this view of men, women, people of all colors being equal fed into them being uh, a, a very activist in a lot of these causes. For example, Susan B. Anthony came out of a Quaker family. So um, the way the Quakers are organized, they would have their meeting houses, and many of us may live in places where there's a meeting house road. Um, the meeting house, the meetings which were the congregations, would then get together at these larger facilities every so often and um, talk about their, their faith and talk about what was going on, uh, the direction that they wanted to take. So here, um, for those of you downtown Rochester, New York, there actually is a Quaker, Quaker meeting house on the corner of Sio Street and Charlotte Street. Um, this lower picture is the meeting house at Farmington, which was a, a primary meeting house and one where these congregations would gather for larger meetings. Um, the Quaker meeting house in Farmington uh, has been restored over the last few years, and that's another thing that you can look into if you're interested in pursuing more of this um, 
discussion. So this actually is a picture of some Quakers within the Farmington Meeting House. Uh, again, many Quakers saw and supported a lot of these related causes, abolition, women's rights, and temperance, which we haven't mentioned yet, which was basically abstaining from alcohol. Um, they did with their um, views that of slavery um, in 1828, the Quakers split into two factions. There was an Orthodox faction, which pretty much, um, they all abhorred slavery that the Orthodox at that point had the view that it, this was people's legal property. So it was untoward for people of the Quaker faith to go out and actively fight for the freedom of these freedom seekers. Whereas the Hicksite uh, sect um, were more radical and, and more abolitionist. And in 1842, the Western New York Anti-Slavery Society formed uh, here in downtown Rochester. And this was formed by Presbyterians, Baptist, Baptists, and Hicksite Quakers. Um, there were several other anti-slavery societies. There was a national one that was founded in Philadelphia. And there was also a women's anti-slavery society in upstate New York. And many of these, again, were involved in the Underground Railroad very actively. So one of the first uh, people we'll talk about today is Rhoda DeBarmo, who was a Quaker and she her home was a station on the Underground Railroad. Um, she was a radical within the Quaker faith. And at some point, um, as I just explained, the radicals felt the elders should not have the right to limit the activities of conscience that these individuals who were very abhorrent to slavery um, wanted to promote. So eventually she was quote unquote released from the Genesee yearly meeting. Um, as many of the Quakers that we'll meet today uh, eventually were excommunicated from, from the faith. Now Rhoda organized, um, she participated in the first anti-slavery fair at the Tallman building on Main Street. And we'll hear more about that later, um, the Tallman building. But the anti-slavery fairs, these were events where um, people would bring produce and things to sell and have basically a market with anti-slavery um, things for them to read and, and messages, uh, speeches and so forth. But all the money raised from the uh, fair would go toward the Underground Railroad and other abolition, abolition activities. And by the 1850s, the Anthony family, Susan B. Anthony's uh, parents, um, had a farm around the uh, Brooks Avenue Gates area. They held weekly meetings at their farm to discuss various reforms, including the abolition of slavery. And by 1850, Susan B. Anthony had moved from Kanajahari, where she'd been teaching for 15 years, uh, to live on her family's farm. So she was in the mix at this point. Um, and as a result of that, Rhoda and many of the, several of the other women we'll talk about um, they had, they were very active in the women's rights movement and went to vote with Susan B. Anthony uh, in 1872. Now, Isaac and Amy Kirby Post are two other very prominent abolitionists. And here's an example of where I'd like to read something from her writings. A history of Rochester would hardly be complete without some reference to the wonderful Underground Railroad, which was kept in active operation as long as slavery of the Negro race continued. The secrecy of its construction, its marvelous origin, the great number of passengers, the amount of freight transported thereon can never be told. All its work was done in the dark. Although it had its depots, stations, passenger agents, and conductors in every state in the Union, daylight never shone upon it. Its states had no electric lights, and the passengers no guide aside from that blessed light in the heavens known as the North Star. History furnishes nothing more replete with deeds of heroic daring than the bold, constant, and efficient help rendered to these fleeing fugitives by the colored men and women of this city. They were always ready to fight for a fugitive slave, and if they failed to rescue one here, they would form a company of stalwart men and follow the party, spy out where they were stopping for the night, and generally finding the watchman asleep, they only failed once to return in triumph with their rescued brother or sister. 
So what this is saying is that if these groups knew that there was someone trying to take the slave uh, back down south, um, they would actually form parties to go and um, follow up with the group, wait till they were asleep and bring the freedom seeker back, uh, supposedly, hopefully to get them back over to. So this is Isaac and this is Amy and this is their house on uh, well, Ben Sophia Street. It's actually where um, the Hochstein School of Music is now. And if you've been by Hochstein in Rochester, you would have seen this sign saying the post house uh, stood on that site. It's a picture, I'm not sure from what date of the inside of the post residence. And its subtitle is, in this room, Douglas held meetings with his friends. He was very close friends with the posts and planned the safety of runaway slaves. So um, Isaac Post had previously been married to Amy Kirby's sister, Hannah, who passed away. So Amy married Isaac and um, in a strange mix here, she was actually the aunt and the stepmother of these two children. They eventually did leave the Quaker church, um, very active again in abolitionist, feminist, pro-suffrage movements, and also the spiritualist movement. I noted that the spiritualist movement had started uh, just outside of Newark, New York, of the Fox Sisters um, in the mid 19th century. And it's interesting that many of these Quakers and abolitionists also had some interest in uh, exploring spiritualism. So in 1845, Frederick Douglass was uh, coming through Rochester and he stayed with the posts while he toured the area and again, became very close friends with them. And uh, they knew that he was interested in starting his own abolitionist newspaper and encouraged him to do that in 1847. Uh, Amy, meanwhile, helped organize many of the female run anti-slavery fairs. Uh, she would invite people to the fairs, inviting all classes, colors, uh, both genders to participate and dine together. And the posts were credited with assisting the largest uh, uh, number of slaves to escape to Canada. Um, and she was also, as I said, active in the suffragist movement and voted in 1872 with Susan B. Anthony. This notice here, it's very hard to read, I know, and unfortunately I couldn't really enlarge it, but. This is an advertisement for the first Western New York anti-slavery fair to be held at Rochester in 1843. And it goes on to say the undersigned feeling that we cannot stand still at this situation. It, it goes on talking about um, we, we, we call everyone to understand that this is an all, that slavery is an awful institution Time is short for preparation, but we invite everyone to take place in this fair. And it's signed here, uh, several of these names that, um, that we're talking about. We have Sarah Hollowell, Sarah Fish, Mary Hollowell, Elizabeth Curtis, Rhoda DeGarmo, uh, Amy Kirby, um, all these people that we knew were so active from the Quaker community. Another outcome of the post being so active on the Underground Railroad is um, to, to try to trace the, the stories of these actual freedom seekers. Obviously is very difficult because the documentation is slim. In this case, however, um, there was a escaped slave, uh, Harriet Brent Jacobs, and she had a uh, unique experience as a slave in that she she grew up as a slave, it not not in, I mean slavery is horrible, but she wasn't in a in a really abusive environment until she hit her teens or puberty and uh, through a series of um, being willed to different people in a family, she ended up with a family where the master of the house was sexually harassing her. And she then um, planned an escape. She was able to stay with her grandmother and she hid in her attic for like six or seven years um, to escape being taken back to this master. And I was able to find this. Um, this is the ad that her 
master put in the paper, um, $100 will be given for the apprehension and delivery of my servant girl, Harriet. She's a light mulatto, 21 years of age, 5'4", and describes her. Um, she speaks easily and fluently and has an agreeable carriage and address. Being a good seamstress, it, she, she has been accustomed to dress well and has a variety of very fine clothes made in the prevailing fashion and will probably, if abroad, uh, be seen tricked out in gay and fashionable finery. As this girl absconded from the plantation of my son without any known cause or provocation, it is probable she designs to transport herself to the North. And that is exactly what she did. Um, and she ended up living with the posts in 1849. And Amy actually encouraged her to write her autobiography, which is Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. And this is the only, to my knowledge, um, full depiction by a female freedom seeker of what her experience had been like in slavery and escaping uh, to the North. And she did li live to uh, an old age and uh, she's actually buried at Mount Auburn in Massachusetts rather than uh, here in Rock. But an interesting side story for those interested in the Underground Railroad. The Fish family was another very early uh, anti-slavery advocate family, one of the first Underground Railroad stations. Um, and again, being Quakers, a lot of their monuments, uh, they're not even monuments, they're just flat stones uh, at, at Mount Hope. Um, Benjamin had a shop on State Street in Rochester. And um, here in 1848, we have this great example of how the whole family was all in, in the Western New York Anti-Slavery Society with Sarah serving on the executive committee. Her husband was the president and her son-in-law was the corresponding secretary. So they coordinated with a lot of the conductors we're talking about today. Um, they were also ousted from their congregation for their abolitionist activities. And Sarah actually wrote for the uh, Frederick Douglass's newspaper, The North Star. And they were also interested in spiritualism. Uh, this picture here is not of Sarah. This is their daughter, Catherine, uh, remembering that photography really didn't um, possible until the mid uh, 19th century here in Rochester. Um, she was a teacher and her and her husband are buried here at Mount Hope, though uh, they moved to Michigan in the 1850s and continued their abolition activities. Additionally, we have uh, some other Post relatives. We have Mary H. Post Hollowell. Uh, she was the daughter of Isaac Post from his first wife, Hannah Kirby. Uh, so like her father and stepmother slash aunt, uh, Amy, uh, excuse me, Mary was active in the abolition and suffrage movements. And she married into the Powell family in 1843. They do have a pretty substantial size plot at Mount Hope. Um, and then again, in Victorian style, the individual plots are around this large monument. And here we actually have a calling card of Mrs. Howell. Um, another woman in this plot is Sarah Kirby Hollowell Willis. Uh, Sarah was Amy Post's sister. She had married into the Hollowell family um, and then her husband passed away and then she remarried um, a Willis. Um, and they, so on the other side of this Hollowell monument, it does say Willis and her individual grave site is there as well. And we do have a picture of her. So another Quaker uh, abolitionist we have is Lindley Murray Mur Moore, and he was Canadian and he was a teacher, spent his life in education, um, first uh, in the Rochester area for what we would consider the equivalent of a high school. But he also got very involved with education for um, people who had escaped slavery and moved up north. And actually at one point in Canada, he ran schools to help educate. Um, so these pe people could find a profession and you know be literate and, and work more in the general society. He married the sister-in-law of Lucretia Mott, uh, who again, we see these strong concurrencies between the abolitionist and the suffragist movement. In 1836, he and his wife were very active in the Farmington Quarterly Meeting, 
when they published a very strong abolitionist statement pamphlet, which was a way of um, getting your, your views out. Uh, that pamphlet was called an address from the Farmington Quarterly Meeting of Friends to its neighbor, members on slavery. And again, started addressing more moral uh, issues with this um, strange institution. In 1838, he was the first president of the Anti-Slavery Society in Rochester. Uh, this house, uh, this is a picture of his house that I believe was in the Lakeview Park Maplewood area. Um, and he had a farm in that Lake Avenue area. And um, then later in life, he lived with his son, Edward Motmore, who as a side story, uh, was a professor of surgery at U of R. And uh, as a University of Rochester trustee, he actually uh, championed the creation of public parks here in Rochester. And this is a picture of the um, Moore plot at Mount Hope. Uh, ironically, Lindsay uh, has the small one here, and these are his uh, descendants. So, and his home was uh, a stop on the Underground Railroad. Then we had the Averys. Now the Averys, uh, they had a shop. Uh, George Avery had a shop on Buffalo Street, which is West Main Street. Uh, we see here in the um, business directory that his shop uh, procured groceries, paints, glass, oils, uh, just general, general merchandise. And that was on West Main. And then uh, their home, they were both Underground Railroad stations. He had studied in Virginia, and uh, one of the quotes from him was that Negro cabins, which I saw in Virginia, I cannot call to mind one in which there was any other floor other than the earth, anything that a Northern laborer or mechanic, white or colored, would call a bed, nor a solitary partition to separate the sexes. So this had a huge impact on his view, obviously, how these people were living in uh, what he saw subhuman conditions. He married uh, Francis in 1831, uh, who was the sister-in-law of El El Elizabeth Cady Stanton, uh, who was a leader of the women's suffrage movement with Susan B. Anthony. Um, in a uh, gesture he he was he had been contributing money to the lane seminary where his brother had gone to school and he stopped those contributions when the school decided to forbid debates on slavery issues uh, francis was active in the female charitable society which was an organization that helped uh underprivileged people uh children specifically and um and then in 1853 Again, as an example of how these people work together, we have uh, the Women's State Temperance Society, so that's uh, abstaining from alcohol. Uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton was the president, her sister-in-law, uh, and Rhoda and Sarah were all elected vice presidents. Another point I'll make here is just about how, regardless of how successful or wealthy you were, um, you weren't immune to um, in infant and child mortality, you know, we had had not discovered a lot of the medical things that we know today. And so sadly, next to the Averys here, um, there's a whole row of children that they had that were that, uh, passed away before the age of two. Uh, I believe they did have one or two that survived to adulthood. Now, if I'm standing looking at the Averys and I turn around, I'm looking at the porters. And it's interesting how um, a lot of people who were so close in life are also buried very close together. And I've seen this at a lot of, a lot of cemeteries. Um, the Porter family, uh, multi-generationally and uh, across the family was involved heavily in the Underground Railroad. And again, they were dear friends of Frederick Douglass and a key part of this whole network. So Samuel and Isabella Porter uh, housed freedom seekers. They helped move boats up the river uh, that then would get people to uh, Charlotte and, and over to Canada. And then their son, Samuel, and his wife, Susan Farley Porter, 
uh, were also big activists and conductors. Samuel owned a bookstore and a real estate agency. He was also active in the Liberty Party. Now, the Liberty Party um, was founded on the main platform was anti-slavery. And uh, it was founded by a man by the name of Myron Holly, who is also buried at Mount Hope. Um, he had a key role. He was the commissioner responsible for the building of the Erie Canal. So he has a whole other rich story and there's a lot of um, uh, material available on that. Um, but he did found the Liberty Party and um, Samuel and many of these were active in, in that party. Susan, again, was involved with the Female Charitable Society. One of the outcomes of the Charitable Society was the um, Orphan Asylum Association. And the Orphan Asylum Association eventually evolved to be the hillside suite of agencies that still exist today. But as Susan would go from door to door seeking funds for the asylum, she would also talk to people about uh, slavery and, and abolition. And so she would be collecting signatures on a petition as part of her work with the um, Female Charitable Society, as well as the Female Anti-Slavery Sewing Society, which was another organization working toward this cause. Another interesting twist about the Porter family is that, um, and we'll get into this later as far as um, Frederick, Douglass, Frederick and Anna Douglas's daughter, Annie, passing away at 10 years of age. Um, but with Frederick Douglass out of town at that point, um, Annie Douglas was actually temporarily buried in the Porter plot until Frederick Douglass could return from Europe and acquire the family plot where he and his wives and Anna Annie are buried today. Another porter, uh, Maria, who was Samuel B's sister, uh, she ran a boarding house. So a uh, prime property to move a lot of these freedom seekers. Uh, she also was involved in the anti-slavery society. And um, here is a picture I found of her. And again, I unfortunately, I can't make it larger because it gets really fuzzy. Um, but here is uh, Mariah, I believe is the way she pronounced her name. And when she passed away in her obituary in the Rochester Herald, it was written that, quote, only a few weeks before her death, an aged black woman named Harriet Tubman, who used to be a professional smuggler of slaves from the South, called upon Miss Porter and recalled the time when she used to stop at her house with fugitives in charge. Sometimes she would have as many of as 10 or 12 of these unfortunates hidden in her house. So here we have a direct personal relationship between Harriet Tubman and Mariah Porter. And then this middle picture, um, the way that I looked it up, this house in the middle is actually Samuel D's house. So an example of um, these houses that existed, I think mainly in the, the third ward or Cornhill area as we know it today. So moving our focus away from the Quakers, uh, another key person to this whole story is the Reverend Thomas James, who was buried at Mount Hope. And uh, this, this is his monument. This is his stone. So uh, again, very, very simple in nature. And Reverend Thomas James is a fascinating character, and I would encourage you to look at his Life of the Reverend Thomas James by himself autobiography that is available online, where again, he gives the story of how he was born enslaved in Kanajahari. Uh, his master had sold his family when he was only eight years old. I believe later in life, he was able to reunite with his brother, but was never able to reunite with his mother or sister. And I don't believe he even knew who his father was. Um, he was sold several times and finally fled to Canada and traveling along the slanted stake railroad line along the canal to Lockport. And in his autobiography, he talks about how he just felt that the people who helped him um, were so welcoming. Like he calls out how well-treated he was and how thankful, obviously, he was that they were able to assist him to, to move to freedom. <clears throat> 
Um, now, a key thing, again, that plays into our story is that he he was, he became a reverend, he moved to Rochester, um, and then that was around 1823, and then in 1827, slavery was outlawed in New York State, which made, in essence, he was free now in New York State. Um, he started a school for colored children and begins the first of a series of anti-slavery meetings, which eventually joined the National Anti-Slavery Society in 1833. How this uh, affected Rochester and Project Douglas, though, was that when he was in uh, ministering in a New Bedford, Massachusetts church, he met Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass first had escaped uh, from Maryland into New England and uh, just developing his speaking skills. Um, but when Reverend James was uh, preaching in New Bedford, he invited Frederick Douglass to get up and speak to his primarily white congregation about his experiences as a slave. And again, Frederick Douglass has written several autobiographies that denote his, um, his experiences and, and helping people relate to what it was like in slavery. And again, when we look back on it today, it seems kind of obvious, but um, there was ministering to be done and there was awareness to be raised. And obviously Frederick Douglass rose to that occasion as did Reverend Thomas James. So um, Reverend Thomas James, with, along with uh, William Bloss, who was Caucasian, he bought a press to print a newspaper called The Rights of Man. Um, he began this African church, which is the church uh, that, well, there is a church right now that still stands on not this one in the drawing, and we'll see that in a moment. Um, but he had published the paper, and following the publication of the Rights of Man, um, I think he had put some type of uh, constitution or outline of what his beliefs were, and he was arrested. And he was, in his words, subjected to a mock trial with the object of scaring me into flight from the place. Like they, were, they brought him in, pretended to try him for this crime, and um, he was undaunted. He stayed in Rochester, he kept his ministry, and he kept his uh, abolitionist activities. And then in 1835, that's when he left Rochester, um, he went to Syracuse. He built a congregation, a black congregation from about 20 to over 80 participants, the largest congregation in pre-Civil War Syracuse. And many of those members were active in the Underground Railroad. And then he went on and traveled to Ithaca, Long Island, New Bedford, which is where he hooked up with Fred Douglas, Frederick Douglass, and in each site he was founding or joining anti-slavery movements. Another interesting thing, just, just about how he conducted himself, um, when he was in Massachusetts, uh, trains were segregated, and he actually uh, took the case to the state Supreme Court, saying that this was not, um, not legal, and he won the uh, contest. Uh, and subsequently, uh, after the Civil War, during the Civil War, he moved to Kentucky and he insisted in liberating hundreds of slaves from prisons and what they called slave pens, which um, were like concentration camps of, of uh, slaves. So here's the church that stands where James Church was. Uh, it's the former AME Zion Church at Favor and Spring Streets, and you can see this uh, from Broad Street in Rochester if you're getting on to 490 there. Um, and this building was uh, originally where Frederick Douglass edited his abolitionist paper, the North Star, from a press set up in the church basement, which I believe is the same press that uh, Thomas James used to print the Rights of Man. And uh, during the early years in his church, the church and the side pews had hollow benches, which were used to hide enslaved people on the Underground Railroad. And there was a trap door by the pulpit leading to an escape tunnel over to Plymouth Avenue and the Genesee River. Again, this is all in the downtown Rochester area. And Harriet Tubman used this station as a conductor for many seeking freedom. And again, I'll note if, if you had not 
heard Harriet Tubman uh, always said that she ran her train well and she never lost a passenger. Susan B. Anthony gave one of her last public addresses in this church. And there actually was a set of memorial windows um, for, to Susan B. Anthony and Frederick Douglass um, in this church. I believe one of the windows, the Susan B. Anthony window, followed the Zion Church, which is now on Clarissa Street. Um, and I believe the memorial window to Frederick Douglass had been lost. But this was a very active um, site of Underground Railroad activity. So another resident we have at Mount Hope, uh, William S. Falls, was a printing foreman at the Rochester Daily Advertiser. So the Tallman building, and we'll talk about Mr. Tallman later, um, was in downtown, is <clears throat> in downtown Rochester, and there was a variety of publishing establishments within the building. It was a commercial building uh, across from where the Reynolds Arcade is now. And uh, he, and there were a lot of, there was a lot of abolitionist activity in the building. So it wasn't unusual to have uh, freedom seekers in the press room of the paper. Um, some of these folks would, uh, some of these employees would uh, arrive for work and find there were freedom seekers waiting to be let in or hid for the day. And um, he at William Falls and his friends were always soliciting funds for what they called shipping a bale of Southern goods to Canada and uh, would basically hit people up for funding uh, to help this operation. Um, this letter in the middle, I'm always fascinated when I do research to actually see people's handwriting. So I couldn't really depict the content of this, um, but this is William S. Falls writing to an extreme, uh, extremely well-known abolitionist, uh, Reverend Higginson in Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, so presumably is about uh, the Underground Railroad or their joint abolitionist activities. And again, just like earlier, I had a quotation from Amy Post um, we have a passage here. There's actually a, a whole article about this, but I'll just read some highlights by William S. Falls. One fine morning in the month of June, 1851, a valued and esteemed friend whose remains now repose in our own beautiful Mount Hope, hastily entered my place of business and in an excited manner said, friend Falls, put on your coat and come with me. I asked him to explain he evaded the request. He led the way to the rear of the darkest nook on the premises and we came upon the stalwart form of a fine Spanish specimen of the Negro race. He was in a crouching posture and seemingly in great fear lest his master who was upon his track, that was the thing, you, you, your masters were actually chasing you up north. Um, and he was at this moment in actually in the city pursuing him, might learn of his whereabouts. Uh, our manner and soothing words had the effect of inspiring him with confidence to our motives. Suffice it to say that the quote unquote fugitive was properly cared for during the balance of that day. And when the shades of night set in, he made his way to safety in Charlotte where lay the Canadian steamer, the Magnet, on board which he was conveyed beyond the reach of all earthly masters. He continues, this was my first experience in underground railroading. From this time till the inauguration of the rebellion, nearly a hundred unfortunates, male and female, children and adults, passed through my hands. So thank you, William. Horace McGuire was also uh, working in the Talman building, uh, noting again that it wasn't unusual to find runaways finding uh, or waiting in front of the offices when they got to work. And again, we have this beautiful passage. He, he lived in 1917 and in 1916, he related uh, his story. So these are his, he, his families and his monuments at Mount Hope um, here on the left. But he says, I became conversant with the location of the stations of the so-called Underground Railroad. The house of Mr. Douglas on South Avenue was the principal station here. And that house is now gone. Trusted men and women did not hesitate to open their houses and secrete, secret these fugitives from slavery. 
Among the friends in Rochester were Isaac Post, William Hallowell, and Samuel D. Porter. At night, these Black people were taken on their way to Charlotte or Oswego or Lewiston, going as far as possible during the darkness and stopping at daylight to be again secreted into the houses or barns of men known to be of the abolition party. It is related that a family of five persons, colored fugitives, were hidden in the barn of Saint Mr. Samuel D. Porter on the corner of Fitzhugh and Spring Streets. The officers had searched Mr. Porter's house and barn, but they had failed to look under the hay. He went on to serve in the Union Army in the Civil War. And also, he relates this story of how John Brown came to visit Frederick Douglass as he was planning his raid in Harper's Ferry. So here we have an eyewitness to a meeting. I mean, Frederick Douglass and John Brown were friends, but we have this eyewitness to this meeting. Um, and for those of you who do not know, John Brown tried to initiate a slave revolt in the Southern states by taking over the federal arsenal in Harper's Ferry, which really became a prelude to the Civil War. And Brown had asked Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass, who he'd met years before in Massachusetts, to join him. And I believe that Tubman was supportive, but Douglas was not. Douglas thought this was a suicide mission and this is not the way to go about it. We need to go through legislative means, not violence. Um, but Horace continues, when Mr. Douglas came in, the greeting between the white man and the former slave was very cordial. They had been friends for years. The two men talked freely and I recall only enough of the conversation to have been convinced that in the most earnest terms, Mr. Douglas entreated his friend to abandon this project. This was several months prior to October 16, 1859, when the same white man, John Brown, was arrested and put to death for his ill-advised raid at Harper's Ferry. And again, side note, um, John Brown has, uh, there is a farm up near Lake Placid uh, that I was able to visit last year. It is a, a national park site that gives a lot more detail into Brown's activities and um, the upstate New York happenings in the Underground Railroad and abolition. Now this slide, um, lots of interesting faces. So Brown's party was defeated by a company of US Marines led by Robert E. Lee. So we have this young Robert E. Lee here, we were used to the old picture with the white beard and here he is. He was in overall command of the operation of the retaking of the arsenal. Stonewall Jackson, another name from the Civil War, was also part of the troops um, that were guarding Brown after he was arrested. And as I investigated this more, obviously John Brown was convicted. Um, he was sentenced to hang and um, in a weird juxtaposition, both John Wilkes Booth, the assassin who killed Abraham Lincoln, and the poet Walt Whitman were spectators at John Brown's execution. Another twist to this is that this whole case was extensively covered by the press, and it was one of the first such, such national stories to be publicized using the then new electrical telegraph system, which of course, in the Rochester area, um, there's a whole other story around uh, West formation and consolidation of Western Union um, in, the, in the telegraph companies in the late 19th century. Henry Selden, who was Susan B. Anthony's defense attorney, would be in 1872, was a very uh, esteemed attorney and became a very, uh, I believe, the highest ranking judge in New York State eventually. He was also a Lieutenant Governor later in his career. But at this point, um, after John Brown's arrest, people found letters from Frederick Douglass to John Brown in John Brown's um, stuff. And so there was a attempt to link Frederick Douglass to the Harper's Ferry uh, event and therefore there was a warrant put out for his arrest by the governor of Virginia. And so um, though Brown, though Douglas did not participate, um, Brown was charged with treason, 
And then we have this story from a descendant of Henry Selden, Claire Sayer Selden, uh, in, 18, in 1939, she said, right after the raid, and I'm paraphrasing here because there was some language that I didn't feel was appropriate. Um, right after the raid on Harper's Ferry, Henry R. Selden, traveling home to Rochester, overheard the U.S. Deputy Marshal from Virginia boast that he was on his way to Rochester to arrest a runaway for whom he had a warrant. Convinced that he meant to arrest Frederick Douglass, Selden hurried with Samuel D. Porter to the Douglas home to warn him to avoid the confrontation and urge him to flee. So Selden loaned Douglas a horse and Douglas escaped um, on the horse, getting to, got over to Canada and then eventually uh, took leave to England for several months. And that is when, when he was away, his, his youngest daughter sadly passed away. Now, this slide, uh, a few things. So I just talked about how there was a warrant for Frederick Douglass's arrest. And this cartoon, there was a publication called Frank Leslie's Illustrated Newspaper um, that was an illustrated newspaper. And here we have this depiction of um, the way in which Fred Douglass fights wise of Virginia. And they're, they're kind of poking fun at him, right? Um, they're showing him running to Canada uh, rather than, I, I assume the connotation is facing Virginia and, and the governor and the charges against him. Um, so in response to this, Frederick Douglass wrote a letter to the Rochester papers and explaining that he had nothing to do with this. But one of the uh, quotes from that letter was, I have always been more distinguished for running than fighting. And, and the ironic twist there, you know, first of all, Frank Leslie picked this up, you know, like as if this was an act of cowardice. But remember, Frederick Douglass had already ran with the help of his wife, Anna, from slavery in Maryland and moved to upstate New York. So, um, so that's one interesting, oops, aspect of this. The other is that Frederick Douglass he really had an issue, as he should have, of the way that anytime people depicted Blacks in these illustrations, he said, it seems to us next impossible for white men to take likenesses of Black men without most grossly exaggerating their distinctive features. You know, not every Black person looks the same. And this was something that also played into Frederick Douglass's being one of, if not the most uh, photographed uh, African-American person in the United States in the 19th century. He felt it was very important that people understand that you know, Blacks were people, <laughs> that, that this wasn't some caricature of a person or an animal. And um, so I thought when I was finding, when I found this cartoon, I just thought this is another example of, you know, this is nothing like Frederick Douglass looked like, um, but this is what a lot of people saw. And without photography and without more realistic face-to-face -face encounters, um, people could make their own assumptions that were not going to be positive. So I mentioned about Annie Douglas, and uh, she is buried at Mount Hope, uh, again, initially in the Porter plot. And recently, um, there was a um, ceremony and a new monument installed by the Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives Group at the family plot, um, honoring Annie Douglas and Anna Douglas, uh, Frederick Douglass's wife of 44 years. Now, the, the cemetery, the, the families control what is in on their monuments and so forth. And so initially there was one monument on the Douglas plot that had Frederick, it, it was initially Annie, but she died first, and then Frederick was there, and then Anna um, actually passed away in, in another city, um, but that after they'd moved out of Rochester, but then everyone was interred here. But we have these beautiful new monuments that really call out um, the Anna and Annie, because even though Annie was only 10 years old, she apparently adored John Brown. Um, there's, there's stories of when he would visit and, and um, this is her obituary where uh, people are talking with great respect for her because even though obviously being a child, she's not a, an active abolitionist, but her heart was there 
And so here we see, you know, Anna was the youngest of the children and an abolitionist in the making. And in, even in the obituary at the time, it said thoughtful beyond her years, she seems to have taken into her mind something of the agitation of times attendant upon the Harper's Ferry event and the supposed connection of her father therewith and the consequent harm that would come to him because of it. Her mind, we are told, haunted with this idea, entered into a cloud of grief and she drooped and faded and died. And when this little grave is covered and the sod grown, let the stone be raised over it, saying, here lies the remains of one of the first young spring flowers of liberty, nipped by the untimely frost of the American wrong and justice. Now that is not what Stone said, um, but the, the connotation and the emotion around um, why she died and, and what made her ill I, you know, I'm not a physician, but this perception that she was just stressed out and, and very upset, not only with what happened to John Brown, but the fact how her father had run away to Europe and who knew what was going to happen to him. Um, it was a tragedy that after a several month illness, she passed away. Okay. So now we're starting to approach the... Um, we're, we're in the Civil War, and uh, Frederick Douglass started actively becoming, uh, speaking throughout the Union on the topic of Black enlistment. And both Douglass and his son, Junior, uh, became Army recruiters. Um, two of his sons joined the 54th Massachusetts U.S. Colored Troops Regiment. Um, I, I don't think either of them are actually in this picture, but I was able to find a picture of um, the infantry of the 54th. And here is one of the signs that was postered around town, you know, men of color. Now, again, there was not a large population of, of blacks in Rochester, but we did have volunteers into the Union Army, several that are buried at Mount Hope. And here we see, you know, it's now or never, uh, fail now and our race is doomed. Valor and heroism. Are free men less brave than slaves? Our last opportunity has come. Just these very strident uh, pulls into the military and promoting uh, recruitment into fighting for the freedom of all as abolition had become a key uh, piece of the Civil War platform. So Thomas Jefferson Morgan, who, um, became eventually a brigadier general in the Civil War. Uh, he organized the 14th US Colored Troop and later two other colored troops. Um, he commanded them and um, in 1865, after the Civil War, he resigned to attend the, the uh, seminary. And then he was a Baptist minister for 20 years and promoting public education. Um, well known in some tributes, well known for advocating for the colored people at any opportunity he had, he would be writing and speaking about the cause and strove to provide educational advantages for the rising generation. And a quote from him, my grandfather was a slaveholder. My father was an abolitionist. And while I was a student, I learned to believe in the brotherhood of man and to hate slavery. And this here is an obituary of when he died of um, kidney disease. And he, um, and this just goes into his, uh, his career and how he had um, formed these troops and then became a minister subsequently. Now, John Kedzie uh, and his wife, um, Kedzie was a jeweler, uh, a silversmith, and he invented Kedzie's water filter. And this, again, is his very nondescript grave at, at Mount Hope. Um, we have John here, 1809 to 1889, 80 years old. And this is he with his wife and son. So very nondescript uh, grave site. But he was an active abolitionist and um, he maintained underground railroad stations at several properties that he had in Rochester on Ford Street, Alexander and North Washington. 
And here, um, how he plays into the story is he lived on Alexander Street. He also purchased for or transferred to Douglas, another property he had on Alexander Street, which became the family's first home in Rochester. So Frederick Douglass and his family lived um, in the house, which I'll show in a moment. Um, and then they moved to South Avenue and then they moved to Hamilton Street. Um, but Kedsey was facilitated that first home uh, acquisition. And he was openly critical of the Presbyterian Church's wishy-washy stance on uh, supporting slaveholders. And eventually due to him, he and his wife's activism, he also got excommunicated from the Presbyterian Church. So here's the advertisement for his water filter and you know the young boys just getting this super healthy water, I assume from his mom. But the, the wording of this ad, um, I just thought was noteworthy. So the Kedzie improved water filter is one of the greatest and most useful inventions of the age. So perfect in internal arrangements that every person having them is assured of pure, healthy water. Also to know to a certainty that they are taking into the stomach no sort or kind of larvae or spawn of worms or insects or strange loathsome animacule or impure floating matter that often lays the foundation for disease. So I'm thinking by the time you finish reading this ad, you're totally grossed out and you run out and buy a Kedzie water filter. So this is the Douglas home that was on Alexander Street. It no longer stands though. There is a plaque and actually there's a um, monument in front of it now depicting Anna Douglas and, uh, and the family. And um, again, they lived there for three years with their five children. Um, and it was interesting even then, this house is on Alexander, just in from East Avenue, between East and Park Avenue. Uh, at that point, it was for Alexander Street, and I believe now it would have been 297 or 300. Um, and so there were homeowners on either side that were fellow abolitionists who welcomed Douglas, and then there were other residents on the block, again, that had an issue with an African-American moving into their aspiring suburban neighborhood. Now remember that in the 19th century, East Avenue was the country. And, and in, in fact, a lot of people moved to East Avenue, built, built a mansion for a country house, and then they ended up moving back to what is now the Cornhill area because they were so isolated on East Avenue. So though now we think of this as the city, uh, that wasn't the case at the time. And Anna Murray Douglas, uh, Frederick's wife, uh, again, married for 44 years, mother of his children, ran the household wherever Frederick was. Um, and it's important to note also that as a free black woman in Maryland, she, she had her own employment and her own money. And she, it was her money and her savvy in um, making the clothing for Douglas to conduct his escape that resulted in his successful um, escape to the north. So she managed and maintained the household. She was caring for all these comings and goings, um, whether Douglas was home or not. Um, so quite a matriarch. Um, and I, I guess she wasn't as, as literate. Uh, she wasn't formally educated. And so unfortunately, some, some people got an attitude about that. Um, but to think of her as anything less than uh, a completely strong and viable and um, supportive, diligent woman um, would be incorrect. Uh, in fact, later she helped support the family uh, through mending shoes and other work uh, that enabled them to purchase their home at Cedar Hill, which is where they moved. Um, so this again is Anna, and this is her uh, depicted on the original stone. And then this is the new stone that was initiated by the Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives. And um, this goes into a little bit more about her history. So if people are visiting Mount Hope and, and don't understand her contributions um, they can, and, or wanna pay tribute, they can do that now. He did marry after she passed away. Um, she passed away in 1882. So this is actually that's after reconstruction. Um, and then his, his second wife also has a monument at the Rochester plot. And she worked uh, again around more about securing the legacy 
um, then you know she wasn't involved in the Underground Railroad at all. So then we get to Frederick Douglass himself. Uh, he lived here for about 25 years, uh, upstate New York being that ripe area uh, to assist with conducting freedom seekers to Canada. Um, he does have several autobiographies that denote how he was treated as a slave and his experience in, um, in, as an abolitionist and as a speaker. Um, in 1852, he split off from um, from one group around how to achieve abolition. Um, so in 1852, he, he starts his own, um, well, he'd already started his activities, but he delivered his famous speech, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July, at the Corinthian Hall in Rochester, which no longer stands. Um, and then in 1853, uh, they actually, we actually had a national Negro convention, also known as the Colored National Convention, um, where Frederick Douglass was just such a huge draw. So that was able to bring a lot of people to Rochester for the convention. And here's, um, this is actually the indenture that purchased the burial plot for the um, Douglass family. This is the sign that you will find if you're at the cemetery looking for Frederick Douglass's uh, site. And then here we have an onward picture of the original um, monument and then a newer monument that was put in place uh, after his death, um, especially when it was realized that the birth date on the original monument was incorrect. Being property and one of the things that Frederick Douglass had noted early is that slaves do not know their birthday. And so it wasn't until after he died and the records of the plantation where he was born enslaved were explored that um, he was listed there as a uh, property being born in 1818. And again, he was a self-educated orator and we could talk all day about Frederick Douglass. I, I wanted to highlight more about these all these other tracks, uh, but just to, to get into this a little bit. He was a very energetic, eloquent speaker. He lectured all over the US, Ireland, Scotland, and England. Um, eventually, English benefactors raised money in 1846 to buy his freedom from his Baltimore owner. So he was essentially a free man living in the a non-slave state. Um, he eventually helped Lincoln decide to make emancipation a goal of the Civil War, and Lincoln consulted with him on the Emancipation Proclamation. And then we have the statue in Rochester that was recently relocated to a more prominent spot. Um, but this statue in its original spot, um, which was downtown, um, it was the first statue of a black man in the United States dedicated by Governor Theodore Roosevelt, who went on to the presidency in 1899. And then many of us here saw as part of a, uh, a campaign the last few years, there was a series of reproductions of this um, in fiberglass that um, pop up all over the city. And here on the right, we have uh, from his obituary, talking about when he came to Rochester, he was a follower of William Lloyd Garrison, the other moderate abolitionists that uh, were in New England. When Douglas settled in the city, he found ready friendship and assistance, most of his most constant supporters being people we've talked about, Lindsay Murray Moore, Isaac and Amy Pokes, William Howell, William S. Falls, Samuel Porter, William Bloss, Benjamin Fish, Lisa Anthony, Grove Gilbert, Nelson Bestwick, um, George Avery, John Kedzie, Thomas James. So, um, and then they go on to say that as Douglas got more militant about his views, some of those people fell off the um, immediate friendship circle, but it also talks here about how in the earlier months of his stay in the city, he lived on Alexander, not far from East Avenue, and he moved to South Avenue. Um, it was there that John Brown unfolded the plan of his Harper's Ferry raid, which cost him his life and earned him the crown of popul popular martyrdom. And there, the furtive business of the Underground Railroad was carried on, and many a Black man and woman entered the house as the last resting place before the crossing of the lake placed danger out of the question. Rochester was the last station in this country of a section of this famous railway 
of which Baltimore was the starting point, and passengers were passed on to St. Catharines across the border. Mr. Douglas was the Rochester agent of the line, and while he did no advertising, he nevertheless let, he never let passengers. We mentioned the North Star, which was uh, published in the Talman building. And here's some excerpts from that, um, a picture of the room where the um, North Star was printed. The North Star uh, paper here, the object of the North Star will be to uh, attack slavery in all its forms and aspects, advocate universal emancipation, exalt standards of public morality, promote the moral and intellectual improvement of the colored people and hasten the day of freedom to the three million of our enslaved fellow countrymen. Um, this had wide readership, uh, not only in the US and uh, certainly not only um, across many races. Um, eventually he changed the name to Frederick Douglass's paper and with the masthead of all rights for all. And here we see at this point when the proclamation I read was the North Star is published every Friday at number 25 Buffalo Street opposite the arcade. So here is the Talman building and the Talman building does still stand. Um, it was the North Star printing office, it also housed an abolitionist reading room where Harriet Jacobs, the woman, the escaped slave uh, who wrote the incidents in the life of the slave girl, um, she ran this reading room with her brother, John Jacobs. Um, Frederick Douglass held gatherings for freedom seekers there and, and including Harriet Tubman in 1843. The building was the site of the first Western New York anti-slavery fair. And it was very convenient that if you go down the uh, side of this building, that's where Child's Basin was. And that basin, when you think that Broad Street was the Erie Canal, that basin was convenient to leave this building, get into the water there, <clears throat> take the canal and then out to the river. And John Talman is buried at Mount Hope. Um, here is his monument there, which is actually close to um, Colonel Morgan, who we visited earlier. Um, he was an abolitionist, financially and politically supportive. Um, there's not a lot of um, text I can find about him, but the fact that he supported and knew all these things were going on in his building uh, speaks to his commitment to the cause. This is a, the stairway in the Talman building, just taken from the door looking in. Um, and then there's some history that's been uh, noted there. And then there's a plaque on the outside of the building that says that Frederick Douglass published an anti-slavery newspaper here from 1847 to 1863. He escaped from slavery, was one of the most eloquent speakers and aggressive journalists in abolition. Um, and this was granted by the Society of Professional Journalists in 1976. So finally, we arrive at the Emancipation Proclamation and Douglas said, I hail it as the doom of slavery in all the states. I hail it as the end of all that miserable statesmanship which has for 60 years juggled and deceived the people by professing to reconcile what is irrecon ir irreconcilable. We are all liberated by this proclamation. Everyone is limited. Liber Everyone is liberated. The white man is liberated. The black man is liberated. The brave men now fighting the battles of their country against rebels and traitors are now liberated. Remember the proclamation was 1863. The war didn't end until 65. I congratulate you upon this amazing change, the amazing approximation toward the sacred truth of human liberty. So fast forward to 1865, now we're in the city of Rochester and the news comes in of the surrender of Robert E. Lee that came in last night between nine and 10 o'clock. The people of our city became greatly excited by the joy they experienced in the prospect of speedy peace and the restoration of the union. Being Sunday night and most of the people had retired to their homes before the news came, the mayor thought that he would call them all up for rejoicing. So notice was sent to the firemen at several houses and 
sounded an alarm and at 11 o'clock at night, city hall bell began to straight strike and continued to ring for three hours without intermission. The other bells of the city, bells of the city chimed in for a while and helped to swell the notes of victory and peace that so welcome to every ear. Citizens left their beds by thousands and flocked together in the streets, congregating mostly near the intersection of Buffalo and State Street, Main and State, where they were advised that Lee had surrendered and the prospect was speedy peace. Cheer after cheer followed for hours. Meanwhile, bonfires began to blaze in the streets and rocket, rockets rent the air. Guns and pistols, everything that would make a noise was brought out and put into requisition. For the want of other material, a barrel of kerosene or refined petroleum was burned at the corner of State and Buffalo streets and made a brilliant bonfire. So the news of the end of the Civil War, not only for abolition, but just for unifying or future unification of the nation um, was greatly celebrated in, in Rochester. And then we get back to our friend Thomas James, Reverend, um, who made some comments 20 years after the Civil War. This was after Reconstruction and actually after some of the laws had began to swing back and we saw the Jim Crow laws. And he says, and I quote, you ask me what change for the better has taken place in the condition of the colored people of this locality in my day. I answer that the anti-slavery agitation developed an active and generous sympathy for the free colored man of the North as well for his brother in bondage. We felt the good effect of that sympathy and the aid and encouragement which accompanied it. But now that the end of anti-slavery agitation has been fully accomplished, our white friends are inclined to leave us on our own resources overlooking the fact that social prejudices will close the trades against our youth and that we are again as isolated as in the days before the wrongs of our race touched the hearts of the American people. After breathing for so considerable a period, an atmosphere surcharged with sympathy for our race, we feel more keenly the current of neglect which seems to have chilled against us, even the enlightened and religious classes of the communities among which we live, but of which we cannot actually call ourselves a part. And that really picks up where what we've been working on since the 1880s. Thank you, questions and comments. That was just an excellent quote choice to end, gosh. I thought it was kind of melancholy, but it's where we left off. May I ask a question, please? Absolutely. I had heard at one time, first of all, I was grateful that you pointed out the difference in the Quakers who were not abolitionists, which surprised me, and the Hicksites. And the other thing that I had heard many years ago was there, there were racial overtones to Annie Douglas's uh, not being buried right away. And I'm assuming there was no truth to this then, that the things I heard earlier, that it only had to do with her father being out of the country and there was no, uh, there was no plot in the cemetery for her that they owned. I, I do believe that you have something there, but I was unable to find specific evidence of that. And, uh -huh. and I think what, what you're getting at, again, the cemetery wasn't segregated, so it wasn't like you're not going to be buried at Mount Hope. It may have been related to the fact that there was a waiting period to be buried. If, you, if it was winter, as our ground is frozen, and you have to be in a vault. Where, but Frederick Douglass was put in the vault. So uh, I do believe you have something there, but not having a, enough verified detail, I didn't want to elaborate that much on that. But the reporters did allow her to be buried in their plot, which solved the immediate issue. Thank you very much. Other questions? I see a, a number of in the chat, but I haven't opened the chat. Hi, Sally. Hello, Lisa. Hi, Sally. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I wonder miss if you. We, I miss you too. 
Um, there's a, um, I wonder if you've seen a sculpture of the Reverend Thomas James, which is in the county courthouse on Exchange mm -hmm. Street. Have you seen that? Mm -hmm. Yes, wonderful. when I was on jury duty. <laughs> ah, yes, okay, good. It's just a wonderful sculpture by an, uh, a, a, an artist named Sarah Rubin that mm -hmm. I've been struck by every time I've seen it. He, he really had a lot he contributed in a lot of ways. And, and I was very surprised when I found out that he was the one that actually encouraged Douglas to get up and speak to his first white audience. Well, it's just so good to remember these people that, that did these things, you know? Um, and I just love these occasions to have us all remember them again. So thank you. Yeah. No, Other questions? So I've, been, I've been watching the chat and there's no questions in it actually, just many thank yous. Well, I, read, well, I, had, I, had, one, but I, put it, I had one, but I put it in the wrong place, sorry. I was just wondering how the slaves got from Rochester to Canada. You mentioned once they were taken to a Canadian steamer, I guess they could go along the Erie Canal, or did Rochester people actually operate boats themselves that took them to Cornwall or Toronto or somewhere? The the accounts I saw, they were all Canadian ships or and in one that where Amy Post was talking about um, how they were watching the ship, the boat move away from shore. Um, it said that once it moved from shore, it hoisted a British flag. So I, I and when you saw the comments of the people around the cataract house, that many relatives and spouses and so forth um, were in Canada. I, I think that they worked out Canadian vessels to do that transport. Um, I could help uh, answer that question if I may. Yeah, go ahead, great. Um, they usually took them to Kelsey's Landing. Oh which, yes. Uh, right below the driving park, park, um, park Ridge or they actually went to uh, the, the port at Charlotte. And mm -hmm. as soon as they were on a Canadian ship, uh, they were in foreign territory. So mm -hmm. they would be considered free. Um, I'd also like to, to mention, Sally, that um, the uh, um, Lindley Murray Moore house that you thought was on Lakeview Park uh, for many, many years was the convent for the nuns who taught at Nazareth Academy High School. And when I was going there, they always told us that the house was part of the Underground Railroad. Uh, I don't believe it. I don't believe it's there anymore. So more East Avenue, Pittsford area? The, the, no, no, the Lake Lakeview Park. Yes, Lindley Moore, what you showed that you thought was on Lakeview Park, it was, and it was, it was. The, okay. I was yes, gonna it say, was the convent. It was the convent for the nuns who taught at Nazareth Academy High School. Okay. Yeah, but I, I think it was torn down a while back. Interesting. No, I love when people share stuff like this because it's how we all learn. Other questions? Do slave catchers try to receive their fugitives from Canada? Um, no, they couldn't. The Fugitive Slave Act, Fugitive slave Act was an American legislation. So once they were in Canada, Canada had already outlawed slavery. And for that matter, I mean, what we know is Canada didn't really form until the mid 19th century, but once they got there, they were okay. In fact, when I was talking about Harriet Jacobs, she had an experience that she put in her book where it was such a surprise when she, she went with one of her owners or somehow she ended up going to England or going to another country. And she noted how, oh my gosh, people treat me like I'm a person here. And, and this was such a surprise because it, this is a, a uniquely American, I mean, slavery isn't, but it was, as Douglas said, a, a unique institution. It's worth mentioning that slavery ended in the British empire in 1831. So yes. The period we're talking about here, Canada was not a place where slavery would have been accepted legally in general. Yeah. 
And uh, we have a question from Lisa. Had your hand up for a while. Oh, hi, Lisa. Hi, thank you. Um, so actually, as to that last comment about you know what Harriet Tubman said, I've heard uh, US uh, service personnel who are black say that in the last 20 years, which is really quite a testament to your 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 final quote and uh, its relevance. Um, so you've talked about a number of buildings that don't exist anymore. And um, I wonder, I don't recall ever seeing on the Tallman building a notation about the Frederick Douglass uh, newspaper or the North Star being published there. And I know the city is engaging in planning for the the river along there and uh, you know, a possible extension of the bike trail and things like that. I wonder if there's an effort to uh, specifically mark and preserve that building uh, because we've lost so many others that, you know, coincidentally or otherwise, you know, in the in the former um, 10th Ward, Cornhill, mm -hmm. you know, things disappear. The, the plaque that I showed is actually on the outside of the Talman building. Is it on the aqueduct uh, side or on the Main Street side? On the Main Street side. Okay, so I've managed to miss it in 35 years of working on there. Thank you. Well, <laughs> that's fine. But but it, it's a great point, though, because moving back to the cemetery, like Pedsey's plot, there's some new columbaria going in, and that's where people have their ashes in the little drawers and stuff. So city, it's still an active cemetery. So there's new columbaria going up. Pedsey and his family are, are right there. In fact, when I went to take the picture last week, I was afraid that they had somehow got bulldozed because you saw how small their monuments were. And so, um, and of course, in the cemetery, in addition to vandalism, which isn't as prevalent, um, we have our weather, we have the ground heaving all the time. So that can affect the stones. So not as much about the buildings, Lisa, but the gravestones and so forth at Mount Hope um, also can be subject to bad planning or uh, you know, getting, getting swept up in, in some more modern project. I don't think that's happened, but I was concerned until I was able to find them. Well, this is, this is the time if anyone who's interested in these issues to, to uh, give feedback to the city about planning along the Broad Street and River Corridor there um, before uh, plans are finalized um, you know, with regard to the importance of saving some of these buildings and access to them. Yep. Thank you. Totally agree with that. I'm a downtown resident and uh, I completely agree. I have a, um, a question. Um, Sally, have you ever heard of a Catherine Harris from Jamestown, New York? She was a, a member of my family back during slavery and uh, she her house was designated as a, uh, a safe house and she had slaves in and out of it for years and years and there's some information online but there's not a, not much and in everything I read about the Underground Railroad I've never seen her name mentioned. Catherine Harris is her name? Yeah. Yes. With a yes. C or a K? Uh, Catherine's with a C and Jamestown, New York. No, oh, it's definitely something to look into. Yeah, because I, I was wondering if maybe they would come more from Jamestown, because I'm from Jamestown, and if they would come from Jamestown up to Rochester. I know a lot were headed towards uh, Buffalo yep. or out into um, that being what, Cataract? To, to the Cataract Hotel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, that was something that I had been thinking about. Do you live in Rochester? Yeah, well, I'm in Fairport right now. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And I used to work downtown at the library. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. It's worth pointing out that people coming through Jamestown may well have also had a Dunkirk, which was Absolutely. a much more the port then. Yeah. Well, and then there's Olean, and I mean, there's all those little towns down there that they were spread out through. And I don't know if my Peterson relatives came through the Underground Railroad or not, but it's an interesting uh, adventure. Truly. Mm -hmm. Other comments or questions or additions? Hellos? There, there is an interesting comment here about the Lane Seminary slavery debate ban and the inadvertent boost it gave to the anti-slavery movement being well covered in arguing about slavery by William Lee Miller. Great oh, great. Great, thank you. Mm 
I'm, I've cut and pasted the chat so I can look later. <laughs> okay. uh, I, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. Uh, how about um, the uh, stories I always heard about the Pittsburgh Underground Railroad on Main Street where uh, the present day Catholic Church is? Mm -hmm. That wouldn't surprise me. Um, for several years, I lived out in Macedon and uh, was the village historian. <laughs> and um, there was a lot of traffic out. Uh, that, that route would go up out Pittsburgh through Macedon, Parenton, uh, to Pulteneyville and, and to the lake. Well, we so were that's, in, in fact, there's a, a, a church in the village of Macedon that Frederick Douglass spoke in 18, 47 or 48. Um, well, so we that were, wouldn't be unusual that there was activity through Pittsburgh and then Parenton out to Wayne County. Well, um, in the Briggs house, we used to call it, which is just the uh, other side of uh, St. Louis Church. There is an under, literally an underground cave system that goes through a lot of the town of Pittsburgh, up even to the where the Lutheran church is. And that was always, we were always told that the slaves went there to the Erie Canal. Yeah. I mean, they, that, that's what's amazing about the whole movement that it, it, as Amy Post depicted, this whole thing was operating underground and <laughs> um, not without a lot of significant effort. Yeah. Thank you. Just an FYI in the chat, I put a link to a book called North Star Country, uh, which is generally considered the standard modern work on the Underground Railroad in upstate New York. Here, oh, great. More information. Yeah, and I believe as part of the Mount Hope um, schedule this year, I'll be giving the actual tour at the cemetery. So I always like gathering more information and keeps it fresh for me too. But uh, it's it's just, I, I love these opportunities through the library, through the morning in the morning to share this information with the public, wherever you are. Um, and hopefully it will spark some greater interest and uh, appreciation. You know, uh, all, all these paths led to where we are now. Any other questions or comments? I'll make one comment or not kind of a question, but in my family, Joseph Cochran was one of the brothers of my ancestor. And I found a, doc a document or a, a, um, information that at one point there was um, someone who came to his home and said that a black man who had worked for him had been captured and would, had been taken south. And would he please help? And so he got his stuff together and he went to the place where they thought that this person was. He looked at all of the enslaved people there and he could not find the person that he was looking for. And so as far as I know, nothing came of that. I got an email several years ago from someone who said he was doing research and did I know anything more about it? And I haven't heard anything since, but that's like people, just normal people, I guess, were, except Joseph Cochran was, I can't remember what position he had. He was an elected official of some kind, but it's so fascinating. Thank you, Sally, so yeah. much. It's Cochran, C-O-R. You see, yeah, C O. <laughs> I gotta write it. I can't even think. C O R C O R A N. C O C H R A N E. Joseph. Oh, and Cochrane. I, okay. Yeah, Cochrane. So it's so fascinating. Thank you so very much. Right. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it, and um, I welcome all of you to come to Mount Hope and uh, explore more of our history. We have a number of theme tours that cover a lot of aspects um, from the arts to the monuments. And uh, it's just a beautiful outdoor museum in some respects. So I would invite any of you to join us this year for one or more of our tours.
I have a quick question about that because I live in Austin, Texas, so I can't get to Mount Hope. <laughs> I am a member of the Friends of Mount Hope. Is that anything about the tours ever online for those of us who don't live in Rochester? Or do you have to be there actually? Um, they're, yeah, they're usually in person. Yeah, that's what I was afraid of. Oh, um, wow. But but we have these, and if you go on to the YouTube, there's a number. I mean, Brendan, what is this? Yeah, my, my fourth. I've done it on. Yeah, this is your oh, fourth. I mean, we've yeah. had them online for the past uh, what? This is the third year now. Yeah. So yeah. um, so those are recorded, and we do you know like Monday night, I'm going to be going to a, a local facility and doing some uh, presentation. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if we had more online. Um, we're also innovating with um phone tours huh. and I don't know if that will um I know one of my colleagues was on earlier who's working on that um but I don't know if that's going to be available like you don't have to be here but you could still look at the stops and stuff like that yeah thank you Dennis were you going to say something yeah I was just going to say what you just said about the oh. uh, um about the phone the, you know the smartphone tours yeah, uh, Marcia. It would be able to uh, be able to hear the the uh, narrative, but they wouldn't be able to see the uh, actual stop. But we do, we do, uh, and we're always adding to these uh, videos about yeah. this. So there, there's plenty of stuff on online about uh, Mount Hope, but a lot of YouTube videos and things that are interesting. And if you're in Rochester, please, uh, you know, let us know. We'll, we'll, uh, especially if you're a member, we'll, we'll, we'll set something up particularly for you. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. I'm just putting my email in the uh, chat if anybody has anything they want to share after. I hope that's okay. <laughs> Any other questions or comments today? All right. Kelly. Sally, I just want to say how much I enjoyed this, and thank you for Thanks, being uh, thank you for being a, such a great advocate of Mount Hope and the history of this region. Well, you, you trained me, sir, <laughs> <laughs> but it's been a pleasure working with you over the, the last years too. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming today. Those of you who are still here. And don't forget to join us next month, excuse me, on March 11th, 10.30 a.m. for our final talk of this morning in the morning season, which will be on Helen Pitts Douglas. It promises to be a very interesting topic. Oh, that's the second wife. Yes, the second wife. <laughs> controversial figure with a controversial burial. <laughs> that's right. Thank All you. Right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thank It means a lot. Yeah. Thanks.